This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to the McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. Today we're going to begin a new topic, logic. Now the purpose of this course is to understand what computational thinking is. So along the way, I will occasionally give answers to this question. And today I have two answers. Computational thinking is using the right computational tools in the right way for the problem at hand. And my second answer is computational thinking is understanding the limits and pitfalls of computational tools. Now before we get on to logic, I would like to review a bit about floating point numbers. Uh, if you remember, Floating point numbers are represented using scientific no notation in base 2, like what we have here. And M is the mantissa, actually 1 dot M is the mantissa, and E is the exponent. And this M is represented by a certain number of bits. The E is represented by a certain number of bits. We need one bit for the sign, and those bits together are either going to be 32 for single precision floating point numbers or 64. Now, if we're using 32, we're going to have one bit for the sign, 23 for the mantissa, and 8 for the exponent. Uh, now there's also, as I mentioned last time, five special values, uh, positive zero, negative zero, infinity, positive infinity, and negative infinity, and NAN, which stands for not a number. So I want to talk just a little bit about the distribution of these floating point numbers. So. Um, let me try to draw a little line here. Let's say these are the real numbers, and let's say this is 0, and let's say this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4. And notice 1 equals 2 to the 0, and 2 equals 2 to the 1, and 4 equals 2 to the 2. So, so what, how, what's the representation of 1? Let me use a different color for this. So the reputation, representation for 1 is going to be 1 dot 0 and a whole bunch of zeros, in fact 23 zeros, times 2 to the 0. So that's 1. And notice 2 will be 1 with 23 zeros times 2 to the 1. Excuse me, this will be 2. 2 will be 1 times 0, 1 dot 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 32, or 23 times times 2 to the 1. Now in between here, we're going to have a bunch of numbers. Uh, and the last one is going to look like this. It's going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 23 ones times 2 to the 0. That's going to be right here, the last number before we get the 2. And so, the numbers we have here, since we have 23 bits for the mantissa, we're going to have 2 to the 23 numbers. Floating point numbers there. Now notice this is just a finite 
There's lots of holes here. Now if we think about 2 to the 1, I just told you what this is. What is 4? 4 is 1 point zero, 23 zeros times 2 to the 2. And here we have a bunch of floating point numbers. How many do we have? 2 to the 23. And then if we go out here up to 8, we have 2 to the 23. And so you see between 8 and 16, we will have 2 to the 23. And between 16 and 32, we have 2 to the 23. So as we move away from 0, the floating point numbers we have available become more and more sparse. Now the interesting thing is, if we go here to 1 half, what is 1 half equals? It equals 2 to the minus 1. And so that means that right in here, we have 2 to the 23 floating point numbers we can use. And that would be again true up here for 1 quarter. And between 1 quarter and 1 eighth, we have 2 to the 23. So if we, if we draw our line again, we have 0 here. And it's going to look, let me, let me go back and use blue. It's going to look sort of like this. Now this isn't drawn to scale, but most of the numbers cluster around 0, and as you move away from 0, they will eventually peter out, and there won't be any more. And out here, we represent, when we, when we drop off the edge here, we represent that by minus infinity and positive infinity on this side. Okay, so that's a picture of the, uh, the distribution of floating point numbers along the real line. Okay, so I have a question now for you. Uh, the question is, consider this uh, number in base 2, 0 0.011. What is that number in base 10? Okay, so turn off your video, see if you can work it out, and we'll come back in a moment. Okay, I'm back. Um, this is not that hard if you remember that binary works exactly like decimal except we replace 10 with 2. Okay, so let's say we had a decimal fraction, something like this. Two six one. What does that equal? Well, you would say it equals you could say 261 thousandths. But actually what it equals is 2 times 10 to the minus 1 plus 6 times 10 to the minus 2 plus 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And of course this is the same. This is the same as 2 times 10, 2 times 1 tenth, plus 6 times 100, plus 1 times 1,000. Okay, so let's say we had the number we're interested in. We're thinking of this in base 2. Well, it works exactly the same way. It's going to be 0 times 2 to the minus 1 plus 1 
times 2 to the minus 2 plus uh, 1 times 2 to the minus 3. And so this is going to be 0 times 1 half. And this is going to be 1 times 1 quarter. And this is going to be 1 times 1 eighth which equals, this should be time sign, equals 0 times 0 0.5 plus 1 times 0.25 plus 1 times 175. So we can see it's going to be I'm sorry, not 175, 125. One half of 0.25. And that's going to be, and so this is the correct answer. Okay, so let's move on. We're now going to talk about the topic of the course. What is logic? So logic can be defined a number of ways. Probably the best way to define it is it's the study of the principles underlying sound reasoning. Now, we're not really defining here what sound reasoning is, but it's reasoning that makes sense, reasoning that leads to valid conclusions. You can think of it that way. But we can also think of logic as a branch of mathematics underlying mathematical reasoning. It is, it is the foundation of how mathematical reasoning is done. And a third way of thinking about logic is it's the branch of mathematics underlying computing. Uh, computing is based on, on logic. Logic is really the mathematics of computing. So that is very roughly what a logic, what logic is. And now I would like to talk about what a logic is. What is a particular logic? A logic is some kind of reasoning system. And this reasoning system has a language to express statements. And this language has a formal syntax and a precise semantics. A syntax is a set of rules that define what are the expressions of the language, and the precise semantics gives the meaning for these expressions. It says what these expressions denote. And another important part of this reasoning system is that we have concepts of truth and logical consequence. So truth deals with whether statements are true or not, and logical consequence deals with if a statement A is true, does that mean that B must be true? And then the third part of a reasoning system is a proof system that we can do use in a mechanical way to establish that statements in the language are actually true. So I've given here three examples, uh, propositional logic, first order logic, and higher order logic. These logics you'll see in greater detail in future courses. Um, most logic courses focus on propositional logic and first order logic. Higher order logic, though, is much more practical than propositional logic and first order logic. So, high, so if you're really going to learn logic and be able to actually apply it, this is what you want to be studied, higher order logic. Okay, so how is logic used in computing? Well, it's used in actually many ways. Remember, logic is the fundamental mathematics underlying computing. So it's used uh, theoretically. It's used to study computation study the nature of computation, what is computation, 
What can you do with computation? What you can't do? What are the limits of computation? It's also used to study programming languages. And third, it's used to study software design. So how, how for instance, are modules put together and form bigger modules? So those are theoretical uses, but there's also very important practical uses of logic. Probably the most important is with a logic, you can write precise documentation about software artifacts. And not only can you write the documentation, this documentation can be stored and manipulated by computers if you're, if you're doing this in a formal logic. Now, you may wonder what a software artifact is. I have a note down here, software artifacts are just the byproducts of the process of developing software. So these byproducts include requirements, various design documents, programs, testing plans, and so forth. Now, another practical use is to reason about software artifacts. Like for instance, we may have a design and we may want to say the design, we believe the design is safe in some notion of safety, and we may want to try to uh, prove that our design is safe. And this can be done with the help of mathematical software systems called proof assistants. Proof assistants are software systems that help you do mathematical proofs. And the purpose of the mathematical proof is to show that a statement basically is true. It's well known that you can use logic to implement electronic circuits, the kind that are in hardware for computers. Logic is also used to provide reasoning facilities in programming languages. In a programming language like Haskell or any language, we have logic built in so we can carry out reasoning. And what kind of reasoning you can do depends on the logic, uh, depends on the programming language you have. Okay, so those are uses of logic in computing. So how is logic used in Haskell? Well, Haskell has built into it a form of quantifier-free first-order logic. So quantifiers are like, there's, well, there's the two standard quantifiers are the universal quantifier where you can make a statement that says like, for all natural numbers, for all, for all natural numbers, some property holds. An existential quantifier would be there exists a natural number that satisfies some statement. These are often written like this. This would be for all natural numbers, blah, blah, blah. And we can have there exists a natural number. Now, this logic this form of quantifier-free first-order logic is embedded in Haskell. And it includes, the important things it includes are bool. Bool is a type of truth values, and these truth values are called Boolean. This is named after George Bool. And notice that um, Bool, his name ends with an E, but traditionally people drop that off. I don't really understand that. But anyway, truth values are also often called Booleans in programming. And we have two standard truth values, true and false. And then there are Boolean functions. We're going to spend some time talking about these predicates, conditional expressions, guarded function definitions, and case expressions. All of these we will talk about in the next subsequent lectures. Okay, we're going to stop here. And thank you very much. See you next time.